Do you know about ICWA? I was in the foster care system from the age of two months old until I aged out at 18. As a member of a federally recognized tribe, and because I was born in a state that follows ICWA guidelines, I was always placed in native foster homes or in homes that were required to prove that I was connected to my culture. It's because of the Indian Child Welfare Act, a piece of legislation that seeks to correct centuries of forced removal of native children. But ICWA is being challenged in the Supreme Court right now. For native people, the forced removal of native children from our communities has been a key tool in indigenous genocide. During the U.S. Indian boarding school era, the federal government forcefully and coercively removed native children from their families to assimilate them into white culture and erase native identity. Many people are unaware that the theft of native children as a means of genocide didn't end there. From 1958 to 1967, the federal government enacted the Indian Adoption Project with the explicit goal of adopting native children out to white families. During this time, native children were literally stolen away from their families. And by 1978, one third of native children had been taken and approximately 80% of native families living on reservations had lost at least one child to the foster care system. In 1978, championed by Native advocates, the Indian Child Welfare Act was passed. ICWA respects the inherent sovereign right of tribes to determine the outcomes of their children and prioritizes placements with Native foster homes and with family. It's the reason why I got to grow up with a strong sense of my identity and was rooted culturally in a way that had tremendous positive impacts on my mental health and sense of belonging. On November 9th, the Supreme Court will hear the landmark case Bracking v. Holland. If the Brackings win and overturn ICWA, it'll have horrible implications for Native families, children, and tribal sovereignty, which is probably why they're being represented pro bono by a law firm that represents right-wing groups and big oil. Please help us bring awareness to this issue. Protest, share, learn more at the links below. Good afternoon, happy new year, and welcome to Casa LA's Fireside Chat. I am your host, Charity Chandler Cole, the CEO of Casa LA. At Casa LA, we organize the community to show up in life and in court to advocate for children and families in LA County's overburdened child welfare and juvenile justice systems. Through an intentional, restorative, and culturally responsive lens, we train a village of committed, consistent, and caring adults who provide equitable, life-affirming connections. Our vision is a Los Angeles County in which all children and families have equitable access to the resources and support they need to be whole and thrive. Our mission and vision cannot be accomplished until our children live in a world that is equitable and just. That's why we are committed to doing our part to address racial injustice in the child welfare and juvenile justice systems. And using this platform, our fireside chats to bring communities and various stakeholders together to have real conversations about what's happening in the world of child welfare in LA County with the hope of building awareness, informing our communities, activating a safe space for all and strengthening our ability to advocate for our youth. Before I introduce our guests, I would like to recognize that we occupy land originally and still inhabited and cared for by the Tongva, Tatsavim, Serrano, Keech and Chumash peoples. We honor and pay respect to their elders and descendants, past, present, and emerging, as they continue their stewardship of these lands and waters. We acknowledge that settler colonization resulted in land seizure, disease, subjugation, slavery, relocation, broken promises, genocide, and multi-generational trauma. This acknowledgement demonstrates our responsibility and commitment to truth, healing, and reconciliation, and to elevating the stories, culture, and community of the original inhabitants of Los Angeles County. Today, I have the privilege and honor of introducing you to a phenomenal group of people, all of whom are dedicated to transforming the lives of our youth and families in LA County and beyond. First up, we have Tina Rios, who is the champion for child safety and a dedicated member of the Reimagined Child Safety Coalition and co-founder of the Reimagining Child Safety Advocacy Group. This group of four mothers with lived experience was honored with the 2021 Betty Fisher Award a top honor given to her by LA County's Department of Public Health and the Domestic Violence Council. Her Native American ancestry guides her in her quest for quality child welfare for all. We have Tina Orduno Calderon, who is a culture bearer of the Gabrielino, Tongva, Chumash, and Yomei descent. 
And y'all, please, if I mess up any of the pronunciation, I practice, but we're going to correct it here and make sure everyone knows the correct pronunciation. Um, she is a wife, mother, grandmother, sister, and auntie to many. Tina is a singer who also enjoys creative writing and composing poems and songs. To date, she has composed over a dozen songs in her ancestral languages of Tongue and Chumash. Additionally, Tina is a traditional dancer and storyteller who strongly believes in honoring her ancestors by sharing their history, educating others about indigenous truths, and inspiring others to respect the land, waters, sacred elements, and environment. We have Farah Ferris, who is a proud member of the Hoopa Valley tribe and descendant of Yorok, Karuk, and Redwood Creek tribes. She currently works as a therapist and program coordinator for the prevention and aftercare that integrates cultural and community interventions to prevent and or reduce child abuse and neglect. Farah has experience as a social worker and mental health clinician with urban, urban and rural reservation communities, creating a collaboration network for tribal and non-tribal agencies. We have Pamela Villasenor, who is the executive director of Puku Cultural Community Services, a nonprofit organization providing services to low-income American Indian families. Prior to joining Puku CCS, Pamela served as the executive advisor to the office of the tribal president of the Fernandino Tatsavium Band of Mission Indians. In this capacity, she has helped secure more than $4 million of funding for the tribe, including the development of the education and cultural department and the health and social wellness department. She has been a key creator for a native housing development and innovative collaboration with public, private, and philanthropic partners dedicated to establishing the first native housing development in Los Angeles County. And last and certainly not least, we have Angie Cavalier, who is a tribal, tribal court staff attorney at York Tribe. Prior to Angie's current role, she served in Los Angeles County's ICWA Specialty Court of Juvenile Dependency, where she utilized her expertise in children's law and specifically in ICWA Daily. Angie frequently presents at national conventions and trains outside organizations on ICWA. Thank you all so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us and welcome to our fireside chat. For our audience, we will take a few questions towards the end if time permits. So please submit a question in the Q&A if you have one. So let's get into it. The Child Welfare Act was passed by Congress in 1978 to protect American Indian and Alaska Native children and families. Before ICWA, as many as one third of American Indian and Alaska Native children were removed from their homes by state child welfare and private adoption agencies. And the vast majority of these children were placed outside of their families and communities. This mass family separation resulted in devastating losses of language, culture, and identity for individuals, families, and entire tribes. ICWA was created to address this history and prevent further generational trauma. While we do teach our volunteers about ICWA here at CASA, and we check that box in advocating to highlight whether ICWA applies or not in a particular case, there is still a lot that we do not know and we do not uplift enough when it comes to our native and indigenous communities who are, by the way, also disproportionately represented in the child welfare system. So I know I'm usually here preaching and teaching during these fireside chats, but today I'm excited to be a student and learner and simply moderate this discussion. So to my panel, I think it would be so important for everyone here um, outside of what folks have read in textbooks and what we know we're not learning in school to really understand the history of indigenous and native Americans and more so its um, relation to the child welfare system. And I'll maybe start with uh, Tina C. I'll do Tina C and Tina are for as far as understanding who I'm, which Tina I'm speaking to. Uh, hello relatives, thank you for having me. Um, I want to say that um, the reason I'm here is not because I work uh, in it with ICWA uh, constantly, but because Tina Rios has become a very good friend of mine and I'd like to support her situation uh, with her child. Um, I also suggested that we invite Pamela because she was the one who trained me um, to receive certification um, and my goal in, in receiving the certificate was to be able to help people that are in our tribes that don't know their rights. Um, the more people that we talk to, and I do deal with a lot of youth groups, um, I'm able to share with them their rights and let them know that they have the right to demand every step of the way um, to be supported with their uh, tribal with their tribal nation, as well as um, setting up to people who don't really know their rights. Um, maybe it's social workers who don't let them know that they have tribal rights. And one of the things that um, was very impactful to me that Pamela taught was the history 
of everything from the very get-go, because not just the forming of ICWA, but the fact that um, in 1824, um, President James Monroe established the BIA under the Department of War. The Department of War. So if you're thinking about that they're trying to help us, um, that was not the intention. And there's so many different things that have happened throughout the histories. Uh, and I wrote down a few that really stood out to me because in 1830, the first Indian Removal Act, which they call the Trail of Tears now. And so you have this history over and over and over that's happened to the indigenous people. But when you get down to um, the people of whose lands we're on today here in Los Angeles, uh, the San Fernando Valley, Los Angeles County, Riverside County, all of these areas that there's still traditional people living upon, um, we're not even included in the ICWA system because we're not federally recognized tribes. Mm -hmm. And that's really super huge. Um, so to know that we have the spirit of ICWA, which is uh, within California, that is helpful to our people. So again, I'm not a specialist. I'm going to back off and open the door for others. Um, but I do want to say thank you for having this important chat. Thank you, Tina. And I think what you uplifted is so important. And knowing our history is something we don't get enough of. We don't learn about in school. And even if we are specialists or expertise based off of what we learned in college, we don't get the real story there either. And so having folks that have that lived experience and those traditional roots and understanding of the history is so important. Um, so I just wanna uplift that here that you you are an expert, whether you got the little letters or not. And I am just so grateful to, to have you here. Um, Pamela, I heard you're the historian in the group. So I would love to kind of get your take on, you know, some of the history of our indigenous and the native Americans, even what's not uplifted enough in its relation to child welfare. I am a citizen of Fernandinho, the Tavian Band of Mission Indians. Uh, but prior being the executive director to the social service nonprofit founded by my tribal community, I was our tribal child welfare representative. So I am quite aware of the juvenile dependency system when it involves tribes, especially those uh, state recognized tribes here in California and especially in our Los Angeles courtrooms, both at Monterey Park and in Lancaster. And I think what's really important in talking about why we do this work, it's not just about the policy history and the impacts on our communities, but it's about our personal connections. And I think about that and how that's especially meaningful to CASAs, right? If something drew you to be a CASA, it's not easy work. It really isn't. And you're volunteering your time to work with our children in dependency and our those families. So I'm gonna share with you what drew me to this work. Uh, in my family, I am a descendant of someone who was in long-term care and many placements, abuse in the home, abuse in placements, a very different era of child welfare here in Los Angeles. Uh, all the siblings were removed except one. And so I know those stories of trauma, but I also know this, my family's story of resilience how no one in subsequent generations entered the juvenile dependency system. And so I had a very different story than my relatives. And what that meant for me is I didn't wanna see that story to repeat for the rest of my relatives and community members in my tribe. And that's really what brought me to this work is that it resonates with me. And I believe that so many families can have be reunited with their children and maintain connection with their children with the right resources. And that's where active efforts is so key. Uh, and hopefully we can talk more about what active efforts look like and why that's so crucially important. And the truth is the Indian Child Welfare Act is the gold standard. And it's the gold standard because it has checks and balances, really simple things that we know puts families forward and makes tribal communities forward as well, because we want to be part of that family, of that child's story, because they are our future. Tribes don't exist without children. So they are a future. They are everything. Thank you. Oh my gosh. I love everything you just said. And we will end this talking about active efforts. And we're going to touch on that gold standard a little bit too. And I just want to uplift um, what you said about 
you know, being drawn to this work and why it's so important to tell the story of why so many of us that are advocates come into this space, because it's not easy. It's very triggering and very traumatic, um, even for myself as someone that's experienced the foster care and juvenile justice systems. And I think those stories of why we we're here um, need to be told for folks to really understand why we show up the way we do and why we're insistent and persistent um, and won't give up and won't back down. And so Tina, are, I'm going to go to you because I think your story is incredibly powerful. And I know one that you use to help, um, that you want to use to not only help shape policy, but to uplift some of the injustice that happens um, in our system, especially when it comes to our indigenous and native tribes. So if you would, um, you know, of course, tell the story how you would love to tell the story, uh, but we would love to just learn more about you as an individual and your advocacy. Okay, well, thank you. Um... Uh, I, the personal connections, resilient, uh, active efforts, so, and triggering, you know, it's really, you know, when I hear active efforts, um, those who know my story know that my efforts have been of action. And even still, a lot of the times, uh, Indigenous families don't find the help they need and keep them staying together. Um, thank you, Tina, for being a friend. Oh, we lost Tina R, but she'll be back and we're going to get that story because it's, it is a powerful one. Um, while we wait, um, Angie and Farah, I would love, oh, she's, she's coming back, but we'll give her some time to reconnect. Um, Angie and Farah, if you would love to, if you would like to kind of chime in on either the history of child wealth of our native and indigenous communities, its relation to child welfare, even your story of why are you here? Why do you do the work you do? What, what, what drives you in this space? Oh, Tina, we're going to, Tina, while you connect. Sorry we're gonna, that. Let's go ahead. <laughs> Should I go ahead or? Yeah, go go ahead, Tina. Then Angie Afira will follow up with that question. So what I wanted to what I wanted to say, and I kind of have this brief thing I want to say. Um, I'm impacted by the child welfare system, as you know. Um, but I want to say, throughout history, you know, our government, um, United States government, has been intent on seizing and plundering Indian lands and resources. They sought to destroy tribal sovereignty, eradicate tribes, and destroy indigenous peoples, cultures, um, cultural identity, and through the forced dissimulation of their children. It is important to know that this continues to this day. So a lot of people talk about the past, um, just, you know, it continues to this day um, by the way of family regulation. Now, I know Tina's having a few connection issues, but she's, Tina, can you hear me? That's just the I, devil, because they know they got, you got <laughs> important I, don't know. <laughs> I can hear, you're good, you're good. Go ahead, Tina. Okay, so it's important to know that, you know, um, you know, the United States government is trying to force the simulation of our children, you know, um, and that's what the family regulation systems it is. I wonder if I just turn off my video, you can hear me. Let me know if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you a lot better now. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> Okay, so my name is Tina. I'm I identify as an Apache warrior. Uh, oh, yeah, so we keep losing Tina. So we'll um and oh <laughs> there she goes again. I want to respect her story because it's so important and powerful. And I know she's having connection issues, but Tina, can you? And I can hear. Uh, okay, so and, um, I'm a certified domestic violence counselor. Um, I just wanted to uplift our organization, our coalition here, a reimagining child safety coalition. Um, I don't know if you can hear me, but I'll just we keep can hear you. We can hear you. We can hear you. <laughs> okay. Okay. So on any given day, 400,000 children in the U.S. Welfare, child welfare system are removed, are, are in the system. Black and indigenous ch children are overrepresented, as Charity has said. Indigenous children are nearly three times as... I'm sorry that keeps happening, everyone. We'll go ahead, Angie. I'm going to let her pick back up because I know she's having some weather issues where she is as well um, due to the, the storm yesterday. 
So Tina, I'm gonna circle back to you, okay? Because it keeps going in and out. Okay. Yeah. While well, your your Wi-Fi connection. This is not good. Cool. Okay. No, it's 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 totally fine. We're gonna circle right back to you. Um, while that gets settled. Um, Angie Affair, Angie, I know you un unplugged earlier. So do you wanna do you wanna chime in and we'll give sure. it, no? Uh, Nikki, while my name is Angie Moon Cavalier, I am the daughter of Charlene Moon and the granddaughter of uh, uh, Charles and Irene Moon of the Turtle Clan of the Stockbridge Mountain Band of Alhegans. I'm also a descendant of the Brotherton Indians, which is a non-federally recognized tribe, and the Oneida, which is a federally recognized tribe, as is my tribe that I am a citizen of. I practiced for years in the um, ICWA court prior to moving up here to Europe, where I run the tribal court as a supervising staff attorney. Um, I have a lot of experience as I represented minors in uh, Europe, I'm sorry, in uh, the LA County ICWA court. And um, my master's of jurisprudence uh, basis was on the ongoing need for ICWA. Um, so, ICWA was established within my lifetime and has, um, as to the history of it, it really goes back to the start of colonization. Um, most uh, academic scholars acknowledge five, what, what they currently think of as five errors in Indian policy, federal Indian policy. Colonization, relocation, allotment or assimilation, termination, and self-determination. Um, while self-determination sounds great and is supposed to be the era in which we now live, the fact of the matter is simply that self-determination gives the federal government an excuse to avoid their obligations um, that they entered into with treaties with all the, the, the indigenous peoples here on Turtle Island. So um, it sounds great, but each era from the beginning has been marked um with genocide and an ongoing um ongoing um, i guess you're going to say actions taken by the federal government to minimize and restrict our sovereignty it was current stance in the supreme court is just that first step to attacking indian sovereignty and getting rid of the trouble of the federal government's responsibility to every Indian person on this country. Um, so colonization was the beginning of genocide. And I know that some people don't like that term and quite frankly, I don't care. <laughs> um, that's what it was. I'm not gonna cover it with sugar coated words and make it sound great. It was the beginning of genocide. The fact that I am standing here today before you is just the fact to show that they didn't succeed fully. That didn't stop them from trying, but they didn't succeed fully. Um, relocation is something that not all tribes experience. And the, of course, the one that is always thought of is the Trails of Tears uh, for the Cherokee and the Choctaw Nation. Uh, my tribe was originally in upstate New York, and if you file our trail, which our symbol for my tribe is called the many trail symbol, it's because we didn't have one. We had many going up into Canada, down into Missouri, out into Ohio, Illinois, Nebraska, before we finally were settled in, in Wisconsin where my tribe is located today. The Yurok and the Hupa people weren't actually totally relocated, that's fair. <laughs> um, and as Doug Avenatti, who I have the great pleasure to deal with every day, has told me, they got good at hiding. When, when they were, um, when the colonists came to try to remove them, those that survived did so because they hid up in the mountains and up in the um, rivers and, you know, it was their land, so they knew where they could hide. Were they successful as a whole? Of course not, because colonists were relentless in their determination to um, continue the, the genocide that was started hundreds of years back. Termination was the federal government terminating the status of, of, of indigenous tribes as indigenous tribes, and therefore saying that you're no longer need to uphold our government to government relationships. We're good to go. Um, the Menominee Nation in Wisconsin suffered through termination and sued 
and luckily was one of the few winning cases in the U.S. Supreme Court that um, made them back into being a federally recognized tribe, but it took uh, almost two decades. Self-determination where we are, are now is still here, but as you look at ICWA, all of these errors came about, and ICWA is one of the good things that came about out of self-determination. People started looking in the 70s and seeing the forced relocation, the boarding school errors, the um, forced sterilization and um, removal of our children and removal of our people. In California, we had indentured servitude um, where the Hoopa, the Yurok, the Karuk, and all of them around here, the Weops, um, if they were a, an Indian child was seen on the street running wild, that was enough for a non-Indigenous uh, person to take that child and put them in indentured servitude while they provided them with the good life, so to speak, which everybody knows was the exact opposite. They were slaves. Um, and that that is still felt today. Um, but, you know, ICWA looked at that and went, look at all the things we've done. And we've destroyed generations of these people and they are still here. And we're still taking their kids at a disproportionate rate. Maybe we should take a step back and look at how they provide for their children. And maybe we should give them a chance to provide for their children in their own homes with their own culture and their own communities and see if they flourish better because we need to make up for everything we did in the past 400 years. Um, so that's that's where ICWA came from. That's the history that led up to where we are now. Uh, unfortunately, I'm reformed dependency lawyer, so I'd like to see the entire dependency position of the system burn to the ground <laughs> and, um, and start it over because we are not doing an ICWA is, ICWA is the gold standard. You hear that all over the country. I don't understand then how come there's such a fight to have this gold standard applied because in my view, it should not only be the gold standard for Indian kids, ICWA should be the gold standard for every child out there. And that's not gonna happen in our current dependency system. Um, I can go on all day on this. So oh, and I can sit here and all day and listen to you, honestly, this is this is amazing. And, and I, I, I love what you said. And everyone here knows I'm, I'm an abolitionist. It's, it's not a secret. Um, and I wholeheartedly believe with uh, believe you um, and with you is what I'm trying to say. And we know why they don't want to abolish the child welfare system and reimagine how we show up for children that actually need help. Um, and we'll, so we could talk more about that later, but Farah, and then I'm gonna do a sound check with you right after Tina, see how you're doing over there. Um, thank you for joining us. <laughs> We'd love to kind of hear your stance on this question, what drives your work, what brings you here and any um, bit of history you may wanna uplift that we, um, that we haven't. Sure. So, hey, young Hamaliad, I'm Fair Ferris. I'm Hoopa, Yurok, Karuk, and Redwood Creek. I come from the Tak Medildan and the Medildan villages, both on my mom and dad's side. They're both Hoopa. And I am now um, relocated. <laughs> they say you do dumb things for love. I moved down here 13 years ago and I'm working um, um, in LA County, and I'm honored to work for United American Indian Involvement. I'm a mental health um, clinician and also one of um, the program managers here at UAII for prevention and aftercare, which directly um, assists families to not get into the system and to hopefully establish that aftercare that is so missing from exactly what we were talking about, active efforts. So, um, you know, uh, as a native, I worked on and off the reservations, both in Netanawe or Hoopa, and also in LA County. I'm familiar with tribal and non-tribal communities, and also within the court systems. We know they're very limited in tribal courts here in California. That's one of the drawbacks to ICWA as well, not to mention we have a lot of other um, areas. Um, you know, one of my good friends was within the ICWA department and is now retired, but she used to always say, you know, it's you have to have an alpha, alphabet soup behind your last name. And that's one of the reasons why I went back to school as an adult. Um, we know within an Indian country, we don't have generational wealth. We don't have that experience within education. So I was able to, you know, come and I went to Cal State Pavangna and also went to USC and um, was able to get that alphabet soup behind my name so that I can um, be at the table. So we're not on the menu and people, we appreciate allies who are part of our work, but um, 
it is important that we have leaders within our community that are at the table and then also understand from experience. You know, I am a child who my mom left the reservation, um, not by choice, but because of the, the services that were needed. And she was trying to give us um, a different uh, life. And because of that, often, you know, um, fear of the system, you know, domestic violence is a number one occurrence of why children are removed from within homes. And it was a part of that whole puzzle. And so trying to work within the system, but also just as a, a community member, I often and um, am a, one of those aunties that people always come place their children with me, uh, you know, and it's sad to say, but it, I always say, come visit me, we'll figure it out. And then because you you are automatically, unfortunately, placed with an open custody case and it, it becomes real ugly. And, you know, the jurisdiction is there when we um, when we don't want it and when we want it, it doesn't seem to be there. So there's a lot of flaws within ICWA and the system and tribal organizations. And I, I think the ladies um, and the powerful warrior women that were before me spoke so many different things that are very much true. I, I don't think I could you know, say it differently, but I, I would, the only aspect that I would like to highlight in addition to what they were saying is Los Angeles County is the largest population of Native Americans in the United States. And it's also the largest um, Department of Children and Family Services is also very large. And on the map, we have the largest systems, but we need to make sure that we don't have the smallest systems of Native. Our ICWA unit is mighty here in Los Angeles County, but unfortunately, there's only so many workers, and that often limits the capabilities to support ICWA and to be um, not just taking enrolled people or children or families, but they need to take descendancy. They need to take um, people like Tina who are, you know, state recognized. And even if they're not recognized, that's a whole nother topic, but how we define ourselves is 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 basically um, not according to the, the government to do for us. But unfortunately, ICWA is limited sometimes by perception of what that is. And we need to continue to go out there to educate because ICWA is one of those few laws that is not just racially and ethnically motivated, but it's also politically motivated, as mentioned. And it is an attack on our sovereignty. And this is just the tip of the iceberg because if they attack our sovereignty, it's not just on land, but it's also tied to our land back rights. It's tied to our water rights. And Hoopa is one of the first 13 sovereign nations in the United States. And because of that, we do have specialty rights. But if they do away with little things like ICWA, they can chip at the mountain that we, um, as mentioned, the, the self-governments and self-determination has been a process for us because we don't automatically have people who are in that place to do it. But we are now. And now that they see the power is being taken back, um, or I feel like we've always had power. I, you know, I, I, I don't think it was completely taken from us. And I do we build we building that resilience um, is not something that wasn't already there. So I think part of that that battle within um, the law is to look at exactly what they were saying is the history of it. But also, it's not that long ago. You know, ICWA was not in place when I was born. And I'm not that old. You know, um, I'm old. I always tell my nieces, please look, I'm old. But I, <laughs> but at the same time, at that same time, we, we did not have tribal sovereignty what it was now. We did not have the right to practice our ceremonies when, when ICWA came into place. And we have not come forward through the genocide. And ICWA should be a part of the reparations. I know people don't look at it that way, but ICWA is supposed to reclaim the genocide and help us down that pathway and make our family stronger. And we are not done yet. And we have to look at it as a war. And I, you know, I know a lot of people always say, you know, it's anti-government, but sometimes it looks like that way if you're from that perspective, but it is very much um, a continuation process, not on a micro level, but also on a macro level. Oh, that's deep. And ICWA as a part of reparations, I think is so powerful. And when we talk about ICWA as the gold standard later, I want to dive into why that is meaningful to other groups as well, <laughs> because that, that's so powerful. Um, Angie, I see you have a, a question or thoughts. Um, it's not a question. It is a thought because I've heard it more than a few times this morning about non federally recognized tribes. I'm going to tell you, if you're here in California, you're lucky. Um, and this is my free legal advice. Everybody should look up California Welfare and Institutions Code Section 185. That allows 
any tribe that is not federally recognized, whether it's state recognized from, uh, from Canada, from Mexico, whatever, to ask the judge to have a seat at the table when it concerns a child that they consider a member. Mm. So this is very important because if you don't know and you don't ask, they aren't going to volunteer. Mm. So write that down. And if you are not, or you ever hear of anybody, and especially if they're in the LA County Equal Court, ooh, they better let you, because I train those judges mm -hmm. <laughs> know better. Mm -hmm. um, but you get a seat at the table and you get all the protections. And um, it's, it's not a must, it's a may, meaning that the judge may let you, but if you're in LA County, they should. They've been trained, they're supposed to adhere to, it, to the spirit of Equal, and they should. I will post it in the chat. Just a moment. Thank you. Sorry. I just wanted to Thank stop everybody because so we have a, a way to get our, our people saved. I love that. Thank you so much, Angie. Tina, how are you doing over there? Tina R. <laughs> I'm good. I don't know if you can hear me or not. I can hear you now. <laughs> the, this conversation is so great. Um, you know, like I said, you know, this is still happening uh, now. Uh, even with ICWA, in my case, I was denied ICWA protection, even though my child was designated as an Indian child. That's what they call it in the, you know, in the courts, um, because it is up to the judge. It really is. Um, it's up to the judge, social workers. They don't like us standing up for ourselves. Who do we think we are standing up for our rights, our sovereignty? Um, they look at us and... Um, I don't know what it is, but it's just, it almost, uh, they fight harder to keep our children from us for some reason. And it is a spiritual warfare, you know, and that's what led me, you know, it was a few years ago that um, I was impacted by the child welfare system. I was shocked first time. I couldn't believe it. You know, I was targeted because of my race by um, uh, my, the father of my child who was white. And later I, ident I learned identified as a white you know, supremacist. Um, he was successful. Um, at what I call it is domestic violence by uh, proxy through uh, DCFS. Um, I'm here. What brought me to this work is my child. My um, my story was published uh, a few a couple months ago by the Office of Violence Prevention. It's in their book, The Storyteller Project. So in case I get cut off, if you really want to know, you can read that. You can request it. Your organization can request it from the Office of Violence Pre Prevention, LA County. Um, um, what led me to this work is my son, after being abducted and uh, returned to me by his uh, the other parent who abused me and tortured me. And I learned that he tortured him too at age five. At age six, when he was returned, my son asked me to promise him that if my if his abusive father took him again, to promise to fight for him because of the things he did to him in his care. So I made that promise and I said, you know, I thought it would never happen again. You know, I had him in my arms holding him. I will protect you. Um, but he did, um, you know, he came and got him and forcefully abducted him again. And I sought safety in every which way imaginable, sheriff, police, social workers, um, but <clears throat> um, I wasn't able to, you know, get him back. Um, he's still with his father who tortured him, locked him in a room, told him I was dead, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know. Um, but still to this day, I hear his voice saying, you know, protect me mommy, like fight for me like a wild animal. And so I continue this fight. Um, I believe that all children have a sovereign right to their parents and caregivers. You know, when I go to courts, they say love, what is love? Love doesn't matter. I would say we love each other. We need each other. Um, our love doesn't matter sometimes. So uh, in my fight for my child, I joined a coalition uh, called Reimagining Child Safety Coalition. We're made up of a group of relentless and purposeful driven advocates, organization impacted families that united to raise awareness about harm perpetrated by these family policing system, regulation systems that aim to destroy indigenous families. Um, our coalition includes 40 organizations, um, first responders like dependency lawyers, uh, 
especially dependency lawyers who witness the unjust and the harm that continues to be caused uh, are these systems. Um, so in our coalition, we actually came up with a list of demands. I want to say we found a way. We found a way. And um, um, you can find our list of demands at www.reimagining, re, sorry, reimaginechildsafety.org. You can learn about our history. We just launched 2021. Again, this, this uh, is led by people with lived experience who, knew, who now have discovered a way out. And so um, we want to keep Indigenous families together, Black families together, all families together. We want to promote safety and public safety, child safety. We know that uh, foster care <clears throat> leads to uh, prisons and homelessness. We know that right now there's an emergency declared in Los Angeles County on homelessness. And we know that one of the solutions is to look at the root and the root is child safety. And so we have a plan and we would love to share it with you. I also work, um, you know, I like that you shared about domestic violence and, you know, yes, Native American are the most impacted by domestic violence. And we, we know that it's not part of our traditions or indigenous traditions. It is because of colonialism. And yes, we say that as a matter of fact, domestic violence in our communities is called by, caused by colonialism. And in my case, it was too. So one of our demands in our coalition is number is our second demand um, where we want to, we ask leaders and legislators and uh, board of supervisors and anyone can promote this and lift this up. We want to create a, a moratorium on separating uh, families who experience domestic violence because often the, it's the mother like myself who experienced, was a victim of domestic violence and the child uh, that is removed and there's a bias in our courts. And uh, so we ask, and this is a lot, most of the cases where children, indigenous children are removed is because of domestic violence, being a victim. So um, please visit our website, www.reimaginechildsafety.org. Join us, uh, we found a way. So that's what I wanna share and I'll pass it along. Thank goodness. Thank for you, this. Tina. And your audio was perfect. <laughs> I'm so excited because we all needed to hear that. And Farrah, you mentioned earlier that it's so important that our Indigenous and Native families and communities have a seat at the table. And I, I do want to say that I am very proud of the fact that the very first board member I was able to bring on to Casa LA was Native Indigenous, um, Doug Bond, who's here. We actually going to let's bring Doug in and see if I know he's jumped out of a meeting, but let's see if we can um, bring Doug in to um, tells part of his story and give input as our first Native American Indigenous um, board member, but also I and Casa of Los Angeles are proud members of the Reimagined Child Safety Coalition. I'm excited to have joined um, forces with them. And so as I bring on, Do uh, on Doug, one of the questions I wanna put out to everyone, because this conversation has been so fruitful that we are 45 minutes in and I wanna make sure we um, talk about two things, um, one, um, there's a lot of arguments against ICWA, especially as it pertains to this phrase, um, in the best interest of the child, um, when it comes to children that have been placed in foster homes um, outside of their indigenous um, communities. And it's part, one of the bases of, you know, the Supreme Court challenge now. And I want to talk about why ICWA advocacy is so important today. But most importantly, what does that look like in action for not just our indigenous and native uh, um, um, communities, but also us as individuals that advocate for children that say what we're doing is in the best interest of the child. I do have a unique relationship with the phrase in the best interest of the child, um, simply because it ignores all of the harm that happens systemically, um, institutionally um, from our systems through that process where a lot of harm, even more harm is actually occurring. And so I wanna uplift that and I'm, I'm not sure who wants to start, but why is it so important that we advocate? Um, we talked about reparations, we talked about all the harm that happens, but why today right now is it important that we as a community uplift um, ICWA and ensure its um, continued sustainability and preservation? Um, and let's talk about the arguments against it. So who wants to, who wants to start? Who wants to chime in? I can go back up to Tina C. If, if you don't mind commenting on that. Yeah, I think the important thing here is to know that um, ICWA does not prevent children from being removed from their homes. It gives us the rights to fight for us to bring them back home. 
And the importance is because we now have a voice. Um, and until 1978, we never had a voice to speak up and we now have a voice. And as each year progresses, we have those, we're speaking up more and more and more, whether it's for our children, for our communities, for our tribes, for our lands, for our waters, um, we are speaking up and it's really, really important. And I'm so grateful to all of you who are doing the works consistently um, because it's time, it's time that we put a stop. And why is it important for our children to be placed either with their parents first and foremost, if their parents cannot take care of them with their families, if their families cannot take care of them with their tribal communities, and if their tribal communities cannot take care of them, at least putting them in a foster system or home that is tribally approved. We want them to always remember who they are, to be proud of who they are, and to continue to learn um, about their tribal ways uh, because it's the foundation. Absolutely. And I want to uplift here too that one of the arguments that we saw in the case um, and in other cases is that there aren't enough Native American foster homes to put children. But when we look at our statistics, we know, and I talk about, I think I mentioned the statistic in every fireside chat, 88% of our children are in the child welfare system because of neglect that stems from poverty or issues of domestic violence, such as Tina and not having a safe place to go to for protection. Um, that's a safe place that's gonna not only give you the support and resources you need, but the protection you need so that your child and your family can thrive, which is in the best interest of your child. And only 12% of children are actually in the system because of abuse. And so when we try, when we look at that and we say there's not enough foster homes, it's more so, in my opinion, no, there's not enough common sense when it comes to supporting families and ensuring that they are staying with their home, with their communities, with their tribe, but also making sure they have the resources and protection that they need when they are seeking help. So I just want to um, uplift that. I think I saw a hand. Did I? Vera? I'd love to talk about yeah. that. So Please. there's two important things to point out. Um, one, following up on what Tina said, when you're talking about the legal arguments, I think it's important to get the information from the premier organizations who are working with the United States Supreme Court in these cases, one being uh, NICWA, the National Indian Child Welfare Association, as well as right here in California, where my tribe is a member tribe, is the California uh, Tribal Families Coalition. And these are made of some extraordinary legal thinkers and social workers working here in California, especially to make sure that they're uplifting the needs of tribal children uh, in the states. And some of that means that they actually have had their own fireside chats on monthly Fridays and having their own bracking breakdowns and describing all the intricacies and what this means. And the important piece I think for the public to understand is that ICWA is not a race-based law. So it's you have to take everything you know and understand about child welfare and throw it out the window. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with tribal sovereignty, and that's what's at stake with the United States Supreme Court. And that's why, uh, even though it has everything to do with tribal sovereignty, it also makes it difficult for tribes like mine and Tina Calderon's, who are state recognized, because we fall under a different jurisdiction in the state of California, not to get really complicated with everyone, but they can't, and we've had CASAs on our cases before um, for my own tribal children, even though we're not federally acknowledged. And I did a training with the Judicial Council of California that talked about that. If you want to know more about um, tribal discretionary participation and 306.6 findings. But beyond that, when we're talking about there aren't enough foster homes in Los Angeles who are Native American, I think there's a couple of issues with that. Um, number one, that doesn't necessarily mean that children aren't being taken in by their relatives. It's just kinship. So it looks different. But there are a whole host of children who are being placed with their relatives and expanded definition of relatives, depending upon each tribe and how they define our relatives. And, and second, it's important to note the, you know, the policy and the systemic inequities that are impacting our population right here in Los Angeles. We know that to have uh, foster homes, you have to go through an FFA. And there used to be a, a Native American FFA decades ago, but they left Los Angeles. A lot of politics, not gonna get into that. But one thing we know is that people, families, want to work with someone who understands them. So it makes sense that you would need a Native FFA in Los Angeles to work with families, recruit families, cultivate relationships with families, and retain them going on to the future. But the other part of this, it goes into neglect, which a lot here in Los Angeles, 
impacts is impacted by the housing. And let's be honest, we are in a housing crisis, not just for Native Americans, but for a lot of people. If we're talking about the first peoples of this land, so my tribe included the Fernandeño to Pavium, we were dispossessed of all our lands, 100%, even though the first reservations in California were right here in Los Angeles. My own family were one of them that had the reservations from the Mexican governor here in Los Angeles County. There were more than half a dozen of those Indian land villages. And so when you, the story is the dispossession of land and the taking of resources and the taking of children, you, there should be no surprise that a century later, we still don't have tribal housing developments here in LA County. We still don't have an ICMS system that understands how to work with tribal and Native American social service providers. There are still many different mechanisms that the county has not been able to uplift or put in place that would allow for tribes and Native American CBOs to finally be at the table and create solutions that would then impact the child dependency system. So all of this is interconnected and it, it's not really, I think, up for debate that things are difficult. It's all these different systemic inequities that have come to a head and that aren't helped by those outside lobbying forces that are trying to take down the Indian Child Welfare Act at a time when we see so much building, not just for Native American and tribal communities, but other communities also who want these stories of resilience. We don't want to hear trauma narratives. We want to tell you this is what makes our, or, our organizations, our communities, our families strong. Let's build on those rather than cookie cutter court ordered plans and really center indigenous peoples and indigenous futurisms by having radical innovation and being able to be at the table and have our top thinkers there and talk about what are the actual policy changes that need to happen that have the one thing that we all need to talk about. The outcome is about moving the needle on best outcomes for tribal youth. That's Ooh. it. That is our outcome. That is what we all need to work for. Ooh. That was a whole mic drop. And, and I, I am just so grateful for that knowledge. And you, you said so much that I've never even knew about, never heard to date. Um, I never knew there was even a Native American FFA that even existed at all. And so I wanna, and Farrah, I saw that your hand was up. Did you have something you want to comment on? If not, we can go, I'm gonna go into, go ahead, Fair. No, just same thing that there there is that large kinship care. And I think that's also the why there's an ongoing education that needs to be done. And I know um, firsthand we so many children that I service within L.A. County, all of them are within kinship care. So whenever I hear there's no foster homes, I'm like, eh, the way you define it. And yes, mm -hmm. it's kind of like those statistics. And I always um, encourage people to challenge it and to to really look at it. And then also it's about kind of, as Pamela was bringing out, it's that systematic racism, right? And as you mentioned, that the, the child abuse factors versus the actual neglect, and sometimes neglect in most court cases are harder to prove because it's in the eye of the beholder, the perception of them. And as we know, within the Black and Brown communities, there are there is a large disparity based on, you know, you have five kids in one room, you know, you have, you know, two families, in, in possibly two bedrooms and that's, but are they safe and are they clean and are they healthy and are they going to the doctor and are they going to school? And again, that's the, the eye and the education of when we bring in social workers and I've often heard social workers say this, but they are from um, a generation and a level of priv privilege that they cannot see that every child should have a space, yes, but the space can be defined and is different. And yet oft, often what happens is they're removed and then ask questions later. But by the time you remove them, there's already trauma within that child. As a clinician, I can tell you being separated. And a lot of times, a lot of tribal entities like my own tribe, Hoopa, Netenewe is means where the trails return. We know our children are where return to us. So if people understand the basis of ICWA and how the tribe can act on their behalf, and that's, I think, part of your question is just what that means and what that, that definition means, the best interest of the child, it's broader than just an individual. And I think that's also according to the Western lens, right? A lot of times people see it as single units and the best interest of the child is the foster parent or the biological parent, but it goes beyond that. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, our education 
in the sense of tribal knowledge and our culture is passed down from your grandparents, your great auntie might as well be your auntie, you know, your your firsthand in other cultures, other Asian cultures, a lot of this is normative, but for some reason with the Native American culture, we have to explain what our culture is and it, it becomes lost in translation in a court system and then they define it. And that's why ICWA is the way it is. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, thinking about the housing disparity, as Pamela said, and grateful that, you know, UAII now has a housing unit in Los Angeles, but that's only part of it. And part of that is the prevention piece. And we need more of that, but we also need more workers that are and more funding that's going to be a part of that prevention piece, because a lot of times we're breaking it and then fixing it. And we've seen that in the past in the history, it doesn't work, you know, that generational um, and I hate to say it, that trauma that is in, enacted on them is is still there because of the the struggles within the system, not making enough money. And I hate to say it like that, but there is not enough money to support it. And within the Los Angeles County, without having a federally recognized tribe, we don't have those dollars like we would if we had federally recognized tribes. And yes, you know, I know Pamela's tribe everyone's getting there, right? We're fighting and we're all fighting for the same cause, but it, it's logistically the government sets you up for failure if you don't have any rights within the, those court systems. But kinship care is foster care. And one of these days, I, I hope there's more knowledge and more education out there according to that. And, you know, hopefully CASA workers understand that as well. Absolutely. And coming from a group myself where we're not recognized for, for anything, we have no power, dare I say. And what's a fun fact for me is, and, and, and this this has taught me that I need to go back and really embrace my roots and my culture. My great grandmother is actually 100% Cherokee, Native American from Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's a part of the Trail of Tears. It's a part of my history that we just never talk about. It's been completely erased. We do not talk about it at all. Um, and that's something I want to, you know, take the time to really understand and embrace. But more so, I heard so many things we can do to activate our communities and ourselves because our fireside chat we have judges here, we have attorneys from LATO, from CLC, um, community members, everyone. And I want people to know what they can do, regardless if it's at the individual organization, systemic levels, how do we um, show up for this? For me, I'm a commissioner with LA County Children and Families. I would love to invite you all to sit at that table and up with this and talk about federally recognized or not, how we need to pour resources and support into these communities and hold not only our LA County Board of Supervisors who I report to accountable, but also our city. We're talking about homelessness on a large scale. Where do our indigenous you know, native families come into that? So I will be happy to offer that platform um, where we are extremely actionable, especially as the co-chair of the county's racial justice committee. We don't play in that committee. We make things happen. So I would love to um, invite you to a, a seat at that table. And Tina, and we're closing in one minute. So if you want to end with what can we do and your comment, um, this fireside chat will be shared with everyone and on our website. But I'm excited. I'm empowered, invigorated to really get to action in support of, of our Native and Indigenous communities. Tina, end us, end us and... <laughs> and thank you wanna... yes thank you so much um i you know i said reimagine child safety coalition we have our our plan we found the way out um i just wanted to say that you know tina calderon said now's the time and it is and i every time i speak or for the past few years i've been speaking and uh, sharing with government leaders and they say government takes long tina you know it's going to be a while uh, yes, let's start. But you know what I say to you? And every time they said that, I said, yes, it, it, the, the long time has passed. This is the time at the very end when the change happens. We've already waited too long. My great grandfather was uh, in, born in a reservation, but he had to leave to protect his family from being removed from him. I am a result. I survived because he escaped um, my child, you know. Um, so it's time. It's time. Let's Let's work together. Um, and my message here is not from my own. It's from all the children who are praying, crying, wanting to be back in their tribal lands, wanting to be with their families. And I ask that we join them in that prayer. We join our ancestors in those prayers to give our kids back. Give our kids back. That's it. That's all I say. That's what I want to end with. Thank you, Tina. Angie, we'll end with you. Oh, you're, you're muted. 
There I go. I lowered my hand, but didn't turn on my mic. Um, I just wanted to share a quote that used to hang above my desk when I was uh, a minor of counsel and now hangs on my wall um, at work. It's by Ruth Hopkins, and it's um, every native born into this world is a victory against colonialism and attempted genocide. You are the resistance. You are hope made flesh. And every child needs to hear that that's in the dependency system. Thank I you. I love that. Um, and Jovi, and I know you're listening. We're going to reach out and we're going to get that quote and we're going to post it on our social media. So we're going to make sure everyone, everyone hears that. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all. I am so honored to have learned, engaged with you all. And just, I just feel just like I said earlier, so empowered to do something and to be actionable and to make sure this conversation doesn't end here. And so for those of you who are, weren't able to ask your questions, we have them documented. We'll make sure we um, post some answers um, in our feed and just thank you so much, everyone. Just so appreciative of your time. And on that note, thank you for coming to our fireside chat.